All right, again. How in the world are you, my friend? I am doing great, Ed. And I, as we were saying just before the program started, this has been a long time coming. You reached out to me a couple of years back to see if I'd be interested. But of course, the whole world changed at that point. <laughs> yeah. I think we changed along with it, but yes, uh, two long years, man. Can you believe that? No. And here we are. Yes, we are. In the blink of an eye, no less. Uh, uh, more or less, it kind of feels that way. Yeah. 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 And we were just talking about the co, how the show started off over there, and then went to Worldwide Talk Show, Ustream. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're still looking forward to getting back to that kind of forum. But with all that said, let's just start. This is San Antonio Musicians Talk Show Network. This is session number 500 and mm -hmm. not really sure. Uh, we're with Ken Slavin, Slavin actually. Yes. And it's a Ken Slavin show from Sam's Burger Joint and Concert Hall, August the 24th. And he'll be there on this coming Wednesday. Yes, this Wednesday. And um, that's come around again really rather fast because I do it every year. This yeah. is the eighth year that we've done it. At Sam's, and so yeah, the doors open at seven that night, and the show is at eight. All right, and he's celebrating. You're actually celebrating your 29th birthday. Is that correct? Yes, I think it's the 30, the 32nd time or something. No, <laughs> I, I honestly don't lie about my age. I'm going to be 61. So. Yeah. Well, I'm your elder. Oh I'm my 64. Goodness. Well, good for you. You look yeah. great. Uh, well, you know, I don't know about that, but I do appreciate the lie. <laughs> I have kind of a baby face. You know? <laughs> you do too. It's, not, it's not the kind of face that, that looks older. <laughs> oh, well, here we go. Let's see. And yeah, so your eight-year run at Sam's Burger Joint and Concert Hall at 3.30 West Grayson. For those of you that don't know where it's at, 3.30 West Grayson, the tickets are at the door, so you can get them. You still have a couple left, right? Oh, yes. They're indeed. running fast, but go on and get your tickets, yes, guys. Please do. Online, too. They can go to samsburgerjoint.com and order them there as well. Now that's a heck of a setup that they've got going on. You're turning it into a, a real cabaret show, aren't you? Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you, it was um, when I first called them eight years ago, and I can't believe yeah, it's been eight years ago, about this story. but I, uh, I called to see if I was looking for a venue to just perform. It was, it, was, um, it was in 2015, so I was looking for a place to perform, and um, a new place to perform. So I got a hold of Eric Christensen, who books all of the entertainment out there. And we yeah, had my nice talk, and I said, it probably sounds strange that I'm calling. I'm a, I, I said, you probably don't know who I am. He goes, no, I've heard of you. I said, well, you know, I know it's, it's a classic jazz music, and you guys are a blues and rock venue for the most part. And he said, yeah, well, we like all kinds of music. Amen. Uh, we, we'd like to give you a try. So I did a, it wasn't the birthday show. I did something else, because I played there three times a year. Now. Three times. Yeah. So okay. he gave me a chance, and you know, I, I promised him I'd do all I could to help promote it because of my background in public relations and marketing. And, I'm gonna need um, you for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'll talk later. Yes. But it, it turned out really well. It, it went very well, and so they said we'd love to have you back. And so I started just. It's become an annual ritual. Eric and I get together on the phone and in emails usually um, right after Christmas time or so. And we target dates for usually May, August, and then Christmas. So I do a Christmas Wow, show. that's so wonderful. And, but, but you have to wait a while to get confirmed dates because they also are booking traveling acts. Sure. And you know, the, the, both the big acts and the smaller acts. And so I can't, I'm not allowed or not able, I guess, to play there on Fridays or Saturdays. That's why my shows are always on Sunday or Wednesday. Actually, because, I think those are great days. They are jazz. That just changes up the whole groove. It does. And I, I've been very proud of the fact that the, the band and I do kind of change up the groove. I don't think there's anyone else who's doing what we do at Sands, that's for sure. Not that I know. <laughs> Not that, in fact, I think in the whole city of San Antonio, you know, Jim Cohn was a dear friend of mine. God rest his soul. Yes. He was a big part of this show starting off. Oh, wonderful. He was my mentor. That doesn't show. surprise me a bit. He was he was very kind yeah. to me as well. He was a, he was a really good man. And we yeah. actually had the I had the great pleasure of doing a couple of shows where I was sharing the bill with him. And really? Did, yeah. Well, see, I was going to ask you about that, but since we're on that topic, yeah. <laughs> uh, how long had you known Jim? Gosh, I I met Jim probably within the first year or two that I was singing. I had heard him play, uh -huh. and I'd been at concerts of his prior to that, but I got my professional start in 1990, and I think I met him around 
91, 92, when I started hanging out at his club down on the river walk, um, I would go there on Sunday nights because some of my jazz friends were playing there and they would let me sit in. So that's when I started getting to know him. And then it's funny, several years later, he knew about my background in public relations and knew I, at that time I was working for a, um, a large agency. He called me up and asked for some help in promoting swing dancing at his club when he first decided to do that. That was in 1998. And so I did all of the initial publicity for him and invited really? the media to come and review. No and wonder it was a huge success. But we had a wonderful time. <laughs> yeah. And then that night, I, the, the opening night of it, I brought, I brought friends, I brought media, and he invited me up to sing with his band. And then from kind of from that time on, whenever I was in the audience, he always asked me up. Wow. And they, it was it was very gracious. Of well, me. what kind of songs did you play with Jim? I, I was going to ask you, what are some of the favorite <laughs> songs? We're going to get to that as well. But still, you see, as I'm just hacking the whole show. Yeah. Well, the, um, I mean, like when he asked you to come up, obviously you have a song in mind. Already. Yes, I would usually do um, songs like uh, "Please Don't Talk About Me When I'm Gone." Um, I, I say that often. <laughs> I don't, do. don't we all? Because they're they're nice to us when we're they're looking at us, and then you turn around. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he was. Uh, I would try to think of songs from like the twenties and thirties that I could do that would kind of fit his style. But I'm going to tell you something. He knew a lot about other eras of music. We did a show together at Ruth's Chris when it was back when it was at uh, Sunset Station. Okay. Yes. Um, I was appearing. I was appearing there regularly. And um, he went to them and talked about doing a special show in the upstairs where we had like two seatings and did, you know, a high ticket and did a dinner menu and all that stuff. He was really good and at he, that. And he brought his whole band, and we, but he worked with me like about a week before. He said, come to my house, let's run through the set list you'd like to do, and let's, let's look at songs that would work for the band and for me and for you together. So we did. Well, you're not going to believe this. That night... I mean, we did some of the things from his era. We did stuff from, you know, maybe the 30s and 40s that I do, some Gershwin and things. But he also did Fever with me. Oh, hey. And I have photos of him. I don't have any video of it, but he was snapping his fingers and he uh, dancing around <laughs> with me on the stage. Oh, my and, God. And, uh, and, and pulled out his uh, trumpet and did it with one of those. He, he did his solo with one of those interesting mutes that he had for his, his oh, yeah. cornet. For his yeah. cornet. And... Everyone, people in the band were saying, you really, you really got Jim to loosen up on stage because that was a song that it's definitely not in the Dixieland Jazz songbook. You know? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, it's a long answer to your question, but I would try to think of something classic and he knew everything. And the, the other person who knew everything in his band was John Sheridan on piano. So no matter I what, no matter what I called, John could... Is he still around? No, he passed uh -huh. away last year. Well, he, he, was, he was. They were pioneers. They were pioneers of this whole group. They were, and he was. He was definitely part of Jim's band for more than a quarter century, probably well, more than thirty years. And actually. Jimmy passed on what about five years ago, maybe I, longer. I think maybe been been about while. five years. Yeah, right. five or six years ago, something like that. And it was, you know, a sudden loss to all of us. It was, it was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. And a shout out, and not to confuse the living with the passed on, but. but Al Deliberto, do you know Al by chance? I he's, don't know him well, but I've met him. Yeah, he's a good guy, and uh, he used to hang out with uh, partner man, so shout out to him. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. He calls me every so often and ribs me about the show. <laughs> uh, he had somebody that wanted to purchase the show right off the bat. Oh, really? Yeah, it was, uh, we were on for about four months, and I started you streaming doing a worldwide talk show, and uh, it made number one on Facebook. You were yeah. mentioning that to me. Good for you. Good for you. That's you know, great. You know, it happened. It was a true thing. True story. Sure. And uh, they offered me some cash, and I said, no. I wish I would have taken it, but no. <laughs> you know, at that time, I wanted it. No. And so it was uh, like that. And then everything, the way it went, the economy sort of went with, with the health concerns that we're facing. Sure. And uh, sure. I just wanted to kick back. And, and really, I didn't want to do anything. How about you? I mean, wasn't it a difficult time to kind of get motivated? It, it was, and I found myself um, doing very little during the pandemic, uh, very little musically. Yeah. I, was, I was working hard at my job, but it was um, not much musically, and I was missing it. Sure. But um, I, would, I, would, I did a couple of live streaming things. In fact, one of them was at a nursing home where uh, uh, Barry Brake and Darren Cooper and Chuck Moses and I performed outdoors 
but the, the residents were looking out from the windows uh -huh. so they, they could hear us. And we did, a couple, we did a couple of other streaming things like that, but definitely missed the live performing. So really, for about two years there, there's almost nothing of merit to report that I was doing. And then getting back into it was a slower process than I thought it would be. But now people seem to be so eager for live music that you know, I've started to see an uptick in what I'm doing, and, I'm, sure. and I feel more motivated. I didn't feel very motivated there for a while after all I that. think all of us went through that. I think all of us were there. It was very puzzling to everybody just to stop our engines mm -hmm. because we're, we're typically the kind of folks that just keep moving. Totally. You know? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the cabaret singer, and you started in 1990? Yes. Is that correct? That's yes. kind of late for a cat to start off in jazz, but you've done it successfully. What was your magic? What what did you do? You snap your fingers. We talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I can say is that I think it was probably um, a short lifetime at that point. I was 28, getting ready to turn 29. That's incredible. And I was, I think it was pent up desire to sing that kind of propelled me because I always wanted to. Yeah. I had sung in school only because I was in Catholic school and you know the nuns made everyone sing whether you could or not. Sure. And I had a couple of times where I had a chance to do a solo or something and I didn't get a good response and I was very at that time, really shy about my voice and very embarrassed, and everything wasn't perfect. So I kind well, what, of what did you sing as a as a child, as a you know early on? In oh, the, as a as a little boy. Sing? Yeah. Well, what did it make you sing that made you kind of feel uneasy? I'm just wondering. Well, 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 I can tell you. Um, <laughs> the first time that in I fact, heard, what was your first gig? <laughs> well, now the first gig. That's the my first. my real first gig yeah. was was uh, with George Bruno. Oh really? Yeah. I mean, well, that's, that's, you're talking about a real paying gig. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. That was at Dick's Last Resort with George Prado and the Regency Jazz Band. Man, that's my dead young good gig there. It is. George and, Prado? And it's because George had been letting me sit in for about a year, and wow. I finally got, I'm not sorry, yes, I had gotten the courage up. I used to come here and play downtown at, at Dick's Last Resort, and he started letting me sit in several months into our friendship because I finally got the courage to ask if I could sing a song, and he let me, <laughs> and it, uh, that's where the whole Mac the Knife thing because I, I got the courage up to sing it like Bobby Darren with the key changes, and he let me do it. And I, I know I flubbed up somewhat, but the audience really liked it. <coughs> he liked it. Excuse me. Yes. And he said, if you apply yourself, you've got talent. You can develop this if you apply yourself. Mm -hmm. So he let me sit in. I did it for almost a year every week. I would, I would bring my parents. I'd call up my friends. We'd fill the table, I'd get up and do Mac the Knife and then sit down. Sometimes I did Fly Me to the Moon as the following song. And then one night, that was a great early, early 1990, he called me um, on Valentine's Day because his singer had been booked to sing the national anthem at the Spurs game in the convention center arena. That's how old that was. And he called me up and said, Ken, um, why don't you come sing with us for the first hour? I'll pay you $50 and you'll have your first professional gig under your belt. That's a lot of money, by the way, Ken. It was. Well, you know what I did? I turned the money down. Oh, yeah. I said, I, That's forget the cool. money. I want you to take me to lunch, <laughs> and I want you to teach me how to get in the business, and he did it. All right. I have George Prado to thank for giving me the sense of um, confidence I needed to try, especially at such a, a later age to be getting into music. And he taught me so much, and I... I'm forever grateful to him. That was their mentor question. Yes. So I'm glad we went into that. He he was my first mentor in music, and then the other really big mentor for me was Polly Harrison from the Small World. Oh, Polly, yeah. She, she and Kyle, one. she and Kyle both were hugely supportive. Polly, was the Polly spent a lot of time with me in music selection, and yeah. And Kyle spent a lot of time with me trying to teach me some technique. Um, they, and we, we did a lot of gigs together for several years. We recorded together, too. Wow. We did a whole album together. Polly is a, one heck of a guitar player. She's she incredible. plays all sorts of jazz notes and just yeah. I don't know. And she was, a music, she was a music teacher at one point. Mm -hmm. and so she, uh, she would help correct me and guide me without making me feel stupid. She was great. Uh -huh. And she, uh, she, she and Kyle both taught me the art of singing more softly. Okay. Not always belting out all the time. Speaking of singing softly, my brother and I, our first uh, gig was at the Boy Scouts. Um, it was a Boy Scouts meeting 
Wow. Uh, yeah, and we were, I don't know, I think like about, I think I was like, I was in the second grade, and I had one snare drum and one cymbal, and they were attached. And back in the day, that's how they came. And my brother and I uh, would perfect La Bamba. We played that like about five different times and a couple of cumbias. And at that moment, I knew that it was all from then on. I just when well, you start hearing the applause again, oh yeah, and that that is just really infectious, no? It totally does, and and, and, it, and it is a it's like something you feed off of for the rest yeah, of your career. I think so, and and it could, also be, it could also be a downer in your world if you hang on to it too much. Oh, if if all you live for is the applause, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah. And of course, the only, stay out of that the, only downer, the only downer Ed, that's worse than that is when no one claps at all. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? But listen, uh, you got San Antonio College applauding you all over the place. You are the director of marketing and strategic communications. Yes. At everyone's favorite college. Yes, and I'm very proud of that. In fact, I just had my second anniversary in June. That was one other thing that happened during the pandemic, Ed, is that's when I was hired there. I wow. started in June of 20, and everything had shut down in March of 20. Mm -hmm. And so the whole first year I worked for SAC, I did it from home virtually with my staff and with the president of the college. And what exactly do you do? I'm just curious. I handle all of the marketing, public relations, media relations, and some of the advertising for San Antonio College. So we promote, it's supposed for both for the external audiences and the internal audiences. But a big focus of our work is to help promote enrollment and to help promote the uh, many services we offer students. Did you guys hear that? Go on and enroll at San Antonio College. Oh, just, yes. Just ask for Ken Slavin. <laughs> <laughs> I can direct you to the right people in the enrollment. Not that he's going to get you in, but he'll direct you. <laughs> And you know, it, it's, a, it's a very exciting job, and it's, it, uh, a lot of what I do is also finding the interesting programs mm -hmm. and uh, courses and things that might translate into good media stories, which also help to bring attention to the college and hopefully interest students in enrolling. So anything in terms of promoting the interests of San Antonio College and within the Alamo College's district, that's what I'm involved with. That's wonderful, man. And I, I mean, I mentioned that you wear a whole bunch of hats. You're also the Chief uh, Advancement Officer at SA AIDS Foundation. I used to you have been. Yeah, that was my job before SAC. And I, I noticed that the acronym was S-A-A-F. San Antonio AIDS Foundation. Yeah, and I thought to myself, wow, he's part of the San Antonio Air Force. <laughs> and then I had to read it again. I was like, no, oh, let's, you know, no, you're, you've never well, been in the military, but you do come from a military background. Yes, I do. Yeah. My, my father, my father was a Coast Guard officer, Chief wow. Guard officer, and um, so I grew up a Coast Guard grad. And, uh, that's how I, I didn't grow up in San Antonio, but I came here when I started college because my dad retired and brought the family back here, and he had sung the praises of St. Mary's University, and so I... Uh, uh, applied there and, and ended up going to St. Mary's, but this was Dad's hometown. So really, even though I didn't grow up here and I was away all those growing up years, mm -hmm. it was always the second home because my grandparents were here and my aunts and uncles and cousins. And okay. so, I, and now I've been—I've mean, been living here now for more than forty years, so it's definitely mm -hmm. home. Well, I remember hearing of you back in the day. I mean, we, that's the great thing about musicians—we always know who's playing, where they're playing, and what they're playing. And uh, I had heard Kent Slavin, you know, and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that would pronounce it Slavin. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Everyone. My, father's, uh, my father always said, call me anything you like, just don't call me late for supper. <laughs> <laughs> That's an oldie but goodie. <laughs> Former Vice President Communications at the Lyft Fund, a yes. micro-lending organization. Yes. I could use them right now. Uh, you know, you've just done so much. And in 2012, uh, you had your own. Ken Slavin. Mm -hmm. I relations. said that correct. Yes, you did. <laughs> Ken Slavin. I was relations. checking my own, so <laughs> yeah, you had your own public relations uh, outfit, and that's yes. pretty solid. You went to Atkins Agency. Yes, that was the, my longest tenure in any job was there. I was there almost 12 years. And wow. that was that was um, the big agency I was working for when Jim Cullen first called me about helping promote his his club. And it, it um, is that still around now? Well, it, the, the one I worked for no, is no longer, but the Sun um, has a, a boutique agency now called the Atkins Group. 
So, and some of the same people that I worked with in those days work there now. But it was an international agency and it's still doing international work, uh, primarily in tourism. So that's where I got my experience working uh, with international and national media. That's when I established relationships at major newspapers and TV stations and things for my work. And really, that's what this show was geared towards, was, um, you know, the traveling folk mm -hmm. that come through San Antonio. I right. intended to go through, and I, and I have, was do the show from different venues, and we'll get to that in a short while, but sure. that's what brings in an eclectic cloud, crowd, rather. Yes, Excuse me. absolutely. And, um, so anyway, you are, you graduated from St. Mary's University, Bachelor of Arts yes. in English. English you write, arts. you write super well. Oh, okay. You speak even better. <laughs> <laughs> and you look just great, man. Oh, uh, thank uh, you. I don't know what else you can do, man. <laughs> Homer, Homer High, 1979. Yes, now that is Homer High. Homer High School. Yeah, a lot of people. He's such a good guy that's just getting wasted in the party. He does. And that, that was kind of probably the case for some <laughs> No, that, that was in Homer, Alaska. And that's where yeah. my dad's last duty station was in the Coast Guard. So I did my last three years of, of high school there. It's one of the most beautiful spots on earth. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous town. I can't imagine. And it's just that the mountains and the glaciers and the water and it's a small town, and uh, it was a small high school, but it was a perfect uh, experience for me. I have very fond memories of those years, and I've stayed in touch with my friends from there over the years, and I've been back for two of the class reunions. Wow. There was another one this summer, and I couldn't go because I was traveling elsewhere, but it's and, a beautiful yeah, spot. you've got the traveling Jones, that's for sure, man. <laughs> We're going to get to that in a moment. Okay. Uh, talking about traveling, the places in which you have lived in, and this is all part of your... Uh, your profile, as if you know you didn't know that. But uh, San Antonio, Austin, New London, Connecticut, yes, Houston, Texas, Homer, Alaska, Panama City, uh, Beach, Florida, right? Yes. Uh, Mobile, Alabama, Corpus Christi, Newark, New Jersey, Bloomfield, New Jersey, yes. and some other New Jersey, of which I'm turning the page on at the very moment. Uh, Greenwich, yeah. Connecticut. Yeah. Sorry, it wasn't Green, Green, yeah, Greenwich. Yeah, Greenwich. Yeah. Greenwich. Yeah. yeah, and oh my God, Staten Island. Yes. New York. I mean, this is just places of which we dream that yeah. we could go. <laughs> and you lived in all these places. Yeah, I did. What's with you, man? Well, it was it was my dad. <laughs> there was a, so later on, the movie was my own because of careers and you know, mm -hmm. spent a spent a short time in Houston, spent a short time in Austin. But you uh, were prime. You were prime for travel. I was. Uh, from, Terry and yeah, Connecticut. You know what, now that I'm thinking about it, you're right, from an early age. New um, London, yeah. Connecticut. I didn't know that there was a New London, there is, Connecticut. And that's where I was born. That was my, yeah. my, that's my your birth home. city. And, uh, my, it's just up the, you know, it's just up the road, really, from Greenwich and from Darien. But yeah, I, I have to say, the moving around Ooh. early in my life. I feel completely I, outclassed. No, <laughs> absolutely not. The moving around and everything really made it, uh, I think, made it was a contributor to my being able to be in show business and enjoy meeting new people and, and doing new things. I think it opened my eyes and ears to all kinds of different cultures and people early on. Yeah, and marketing, you know, that's what, I just, I think of the work and I, I really don't know that I've even tapped into the beginning of it, you know, not even the beginning of it, because I mean, I'm just a solo act. I didn't really have anybody that taught me anything. I'm just a musician that came up with a great idea to promote our own selves. Sure. And, and you know, when we're feeling down, we look towards ourselves mm -hmm. to lift ourselves up. Yep. We mm -hmm. find ourselves in the audience, it's just like, hey, you know, that's a tap on the shoulder. Okay. And I thought, well, we'll take it a little further and get a chance to talk to each other in a rather comedic, loose and colorful way. Well, you do it very well. And I think, and I think you're right. I think it, and I think it's a, you've created a great, um, I guess, forum Yes. For all of us in music, no matter what genre we do. Amen. Yes. yes. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. I, I tend to keep it up, you know, and, and whether or not it's a business or a part-time uh, group. It, it's good for the spirit. Of course it is. And uh, so recently, we were talking about this on the way up, you performed at a castle, no less. <laughs> the yes. Clown Brook, Brock. Yes, the Clown Brook Castle. Yes. And your friend owns it. 
Yes. And you went to visit him and yes. you played there. Yes, I did. And and I, that was so just, I just got back a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. The, well, we, we followed you all the way. <laughs> <laughs> we felt like we were there. Yeah. And two of those photographs. Oh my God, Dan. Thank you. I, I, took, I took all of those with my phone. I know. <laughs> I, and that's why we're doing this on that. I just saw a TNF. Is it TN, TBN? Uh, the Trinity Broadcast Network. Oh, okay. I, I want yes. to, you know, and uh, shout out to those guys. And um, well, I happened to notice that they were running a show and they were doing it with phones. They had five phones surrounding everybody, so they they did the, the phone information onto the computer and just do their editing like that. Isn't that amazing? Well, yeah, it really is. But you got to approve, right? I have mm -hmm. a one man show here, mm -hmm. and I don't really like to edit, not because I'm lazy. But because I want everything to come out sure. just the way it came out, I the stuttering and the mm -hmm. laughter and all that—it's oh, yeah. just a good thing, yeah. you know. And so, um, tell me about the castle, man. <laughs> well, I've been waiting for this. Well, it it, it really was surprising and, and fun when I got the invitation. Um, Dr. Paul Boskin owns it, and he's an old friend of mine, and he has—is that is he any kind of uh, Dr. Vinny Bumba? I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't was, think so. He's part of Johnny Carson's show. No, I guess not. <laughs> but he's from San Antonio. Don't you remember that doctor? Johnny Carson? Dr. Bob Bob? Bob? Yeah. Vinny. No, Vinny's, no. Oh, Vinny Bob Bob. Bob. Yeah, it was a it was a figment of Johnny Carson's imagination. Oh, no, I guess. Oh, was it one of his characters that he played? <laughs> yes. No, I don't. I guess I don't know. I'm sorry. No, that's it then. <laughs> um, so anyway, he, uh, my friend Paul had, um, Bought a castle in Ireland about four and a half years ago. And that it, sounds funny. And it needed a, I know, and only he, he could. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a person who's been very successful, and he, and he had discovered he had Irish roots, and he went to Ireland to visit, and he got the idea of, like, I would really like to have a castle, and that's what he did. I mean, how many people do we know like that, right? I don't. So, see it's, anyone. It's a 14, I mean, a 15th century castle built in 1469, and what he did was, it was a, a tower, the castle tower was a ruin, and it had been a ruin for many years. He it didn't just, look like it. No, he's, he's finished a four and a half year uh, renovation of it, and he's modernized the inside, and then also kept all the, you know, the historic walls and everything. It's on 30 acres, My gosh. and it's in uh, County Galway, Ireland, which is in the west. You would have to have a big sound system for that gate. Well, yeah. <laughs> But what happened for that gig was, I mean, we went out there, Barry Brake went with me, Barry Brake, the very fine jazz oh, pianist. Cool. So Paul flew us both out there to be part of a larger uh, invitation-only music festival that he created to celebrate the renovation. So wow. he invited people from the nearby town and the, the countryside there to come. There were about 250 people who were invited. They came to see the grounds, they came to see the renovation, and then the festival was held outdoors under the trees on the on How the beautiful was that? And, and, and he had a very nice young man um, who would, had set up sound and lights and it very intimate. There were chairs. It was a very intimate setting, almost like doing a little cabaret show but outdoors. Mm -hmm. And um, it was magical. And the the space was magical. The the beautiful greenery everywhere and the really friendly. Irish people who were there, we got so many compliments, and people came up to hug us and talk to us after the show and everything. It was it was really magical. Were they drunk? Some of them. <laughs> you Irish, know, Irish, well, you know, exactly. Old where, Campo. They wherever you find uh, uh, four Irish people, there's a fifth. Actually, <laughs> they used to say wherever you find four Catholics, there's a fifth. But and so I guess it was a little bit of both over there. But sure. Uh, they were tremendous and. Paul was very happy with us, and it, it, may, that, it may become an annual festival, and we may go back again, so we'll see. Oh, that'd be great, <laughs> man. I'm sure. It, you know, it's going to be another boatload of photos. <laughs> well, you know me. I try to document everything I do. <laughs> and those are great photos, I'm telling you. Thank you. You know, I, I don't know why, but, um, you know, you've always been a crooner, have you not? I mean, that, that's, that's the style I always wanted to do, even as a kid. Yes. I mean, did you ever want to do any other style of music? No. No. Well, the, only, the only other style I can think of that I would like to do, but I and I still do it. I do a little bit of it in my show every time is to do the Spanish boleros. Oh, really? Because uh, I, I do have I do have some Spanish ancestry on my dad's side. Well, I definitely have that. I have well, Spanish and Mexican ancestry on my dad's side. Wow. And so 
I, I don't speak Spanish fluently. I, I studied it for years and used to speak it really well. I don't so much anymore, but I've learned <clears throat> many Spanish songs. The style I like to do when I sing them is like uh, Los Panchos of Edie Gourmet, that intimate style of like maybe three musicians and, and her. Sure. That's what I try to do, and I actually have recorded a couple of songs in Spanish in that style. But I never wanted to be a rocker. I didn't want to be a blues artist. I also, That's knew, coming up. I also knew, at least as far as my sensibilities are and the way I'm wired, the, the classic crooning suited me, and it was it was what I responded to even as a boy because that's what my father loved to listen to. Okay, yeah. so there's your other mentor. <clears throat> oh no doubt, and, and my mother, and my and my mother, they were the best. They both were. They both absolutely loved that I was singing. They loved it. Now, do you play any instruments, and did they play any instruments? I do not. I, I when I was in junior high school, I played clarinet, but I haven't done that since. Mm -hmm. My dad played saxophone, he played alto sax. His father was a San Antonio band leader in the 20s and 30s. Wow, there's, his name there's was, your other His name was there. Albert Slavin, and he played alto sax and also had a Dixieland jazz band. Used to perform at the old Shadowland. Here in San Antonio? Yes. Now, was, was this, uh, I mean, geez, Slavin? Was yes. out there. Yes, that Al name was Al seen. Albert Slavin. I, I always felt that you were much older than what you're saying. <laughs> no, it's your family. It was me. <laughs> no, my, my, uh, the Slavin roots here. My dad's family goes back to the late 1800s here. They um, came here from Ireland. Wow, no wonder New York. Yeah. It feels like you've been playing all your life, but you know, we know your story. Well, it's, de it's definitely in the it's definitely in the blood and in the sensibility. It, but my our house was full of music. My parents always played records, and my mother always danced and. Dad played sax. He was not a professional sax player, but he loved to play and he had great passion for it. And, uh, so I, I can't say I still play a, a musical instrument, but people like George Prado and Paula Harrison always told me that my voice is an instrument. Oh, yes, absolutely. I think, uh, who was it? Uh, I think it was Joe Posada that said uh, the voice was the actual first musical instrument. So you're carrying on. Uh, and Joe Posada is a great guy. Oh he, yeah, he's been he on has, the show. He has a beautiful voice. Oh yeah, he's been on the show, and, <laughs> and he was just a riot. Not only just a riot, <laughs> but a great person to have on the show. You have a Grammy Award winner for Grammy yes, Award. Yes, yeah. And it's the uh, San Antonio Musicians Talk Show Network, no less. Uh, you know, you said that you never wanted to be a hippie. Uh, naturally, I went that route. <laughs> I was totally into the psychedelia thing. I mean, I, I bought into it Woodstock. I well, I saw a picture of you. From when? <laughs> it's on Facebook. It's a picture of you in a stage band. Oh, yeah. And you have, you're on the far end, and I, I enlarged the photo on the screen. And you have <laughs> long hair. Yeah, yeah, I did. Long curly it's, hair. It's a great long picture. Little hair. <laughs> well, the same with me. I used to have a lot more. Yeah, but it was that was a lot of fun. I mean, I did that all of, since from childhood, was playing. Um, we were playing, I think, when I was in the third, fourth, fifth grade. And we went all the way through um, junior high and then a couple of ten years thereafter. That's great. So it's, and that was the Crystal Winter Band. Yes. I don't know if you had ever heard of that. No, band. but I saw I saw another picture for that. It was a publicity picture of all of you together oh, smoking no. cigarettes. Yes, yes, yes. Tell me we were really bad. <laughs> <laughs> could have been we could have been smoking something else, I think. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, for the, you asked me before the show, what do I like to play? Yes. We're, we're showing some of my favorites, the Doobie Brothers in the background. Naturally, they're on the mood. Uh, but yeah, I love the rock with harmony. You know, yes. it's something a little different than just metal rock. Oh, no, totally. However, I did that as well. I mean, you know, and, and the Beatles naturally turned me under the harmony. So as I just weeded out all the musical influences, uh, including Spanish and conjunto and all this kind of stuff of which like Lori Gums does you know, through the whole night. Yeah. She, 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 she's hugely versatile. We, we, she's great. I met her during, I met her at the old Small World Jam sessions when I first started singing. Yeah, she, and she can sing in Spanish, oh, yeah. English, she can rock, she can jazz. She's a, she's, and she's a firecracker. <laughs> she's also a very fine writer and works for, um, she writes for uh, seen an essay magazine. Wow, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know she that. She writes about musicians. She did an interview with me last year. When she uh, 
when she came on the show over here with uh, Bobby Beal and Albert Flores, Albert Garcia, excuse me, and um, uh, Val Mora, uh -huh. uh, Lee Hall, and myself, and, and there was another cat there, which we, you notice that his, his face is kind of blacked out. Yes. yes. He's a traitor. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's a traitor, so we blacked his, his face out. And uh, that's how we promoted the show over there. <laughs> I have no shame, Ken. <laughs> no shame whatsoever. And uh, let me just ask you something here. What yes. is your all-time favorite song to sing? Seeing as how, you know, we understand that it's a jazz group. You're a crooner. You love that. You've always been there. I, I love jazz, okay? I love jazz. And... Uh, I just can't imagine what your favorite song would be. Well, you know, people have asked me that all through my career, really? and it's hard. I'm for not me the only one. Know. Yeah, but it's very hard for me to, to pinpoint it. My my, I think my problem is I just love I love the vibe, and it's not always so much about the song. Although uh, in the moment, it, in the moment, you can at least I have been in the moment where it's like, oh, this is the you know the best song ever. I don't. I can't say I have a favorite. I, I can't. The one that everyone thinks is my favorite is Mac the Knife because it's how I close the shows. Okay. It's a, I guess it's a favorite in a way because it's what kind of started my career for me. It's the song I first had the courage to sing in public. Yeah. But and I and I do love it. It's a fun, weird song. <laughs> uh, jazz musicians, however, a lot of the ones I've worked with over the years don't like it. They think it's a dumb song. But I I continue. Then I think they're more burned out on it. Yeah, because you know? everyone in the world has done it. Yeah, uh, but there, you know, there are just some... Elvis for Grand Lama. That's your, your, you know, Elvis. Elvis. Yes. that's your Robbie, and of so course Louis Armstrong and, and uh, Ella Fitzgerald. And, but I think, really, in my case, what's more in terms of favorite, I have some favorite, um, maybe some favorite composers, and there are favorite jazz singers that I love and, and most of them are dead but there are some that are still alive. Mm, well, <laughs> so it's my, have to that's a terrible going. answer to the question Ed, but I you're might gonna have to keep it going Ken. <laughs> so it's not a bad thing that they're out and you're in. That's a good thing. Um, so the other guys in your band, uh, these musicians, I mean I've heard their names but yes. can you uh, go through your entire band oh, real quick? Sure, and, sure. And the question before that are these the same band members that you started off with? Are they still with you? Because to do your kind of music, not everyone can do that group. No, right. Um, they are, one of the musicians in the band has been with me from just about the beginning, um, Chuck Moses on bass. I've heard Chuck Moses. Yeah, he's, heard I, Chuck. I've been in the business, I've been in the business now for 32 years, and he has been playing with me since that first year. Yeah. But it wasn't always as steady as it became later, because I had a long period in there where it was, you know, I was doing 200 dates a year. And so he would, and they were mostly like standing gigs and hotels. Who in the world was booking you? And who was your I was booking myself. <laughs> I was really hustling. Awesome. But, but he would work with me and he still works with me and he's still my first call guy and he's great and he's wonderful. The other guys have been working with me, well, two of them, Barry Brake on piano and Darren Cooper on drums. They've been working with me pretty steadily for about 15 years. But they have their own band. It's just they work with me when I can book them, and most of the time they're available when I need them. So it's a passion for them to, to hook up with no, them. They're, they're great. And then there's a there's a fourth member of the, of the band that I you, I bring to Sam's. It isn't someone I can have at everything because, you know, four pieces can... can Is that your guitarist? Well. No, it's the vibe player, vibraphone. Oh my goodness. Joe Caplow, who's Ooh. also, he's a, an all-around percussionist, and he, and he teaches percussion at St. Mary's University and, and elsewhere. But he come, I bring him into the Sam shows on vibes, and it sounds fantastic. And you get that whole kind of... It's a full sound. You know, it's a nice kind of uh, jazzy, cabaret-ish, loungy sound that's really beautiful. It's almost like a uh, Hammond organ does for blues and, and this and Yeah, it, there's, a, it there's a sweetness that it adds to everything. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, it's, very, really fun. it's a very floating sound. Yeah. But he can also, he hammers out great um, solos and he'll trade with a uh, the, with the pianist and with the drummer. Right. So so basically, it's it, you know Darren and Barry, and Chuck, and then when I whenever I can get him, Joe Capone. Yeah, I I tried that in the stage band of which you were you know mentioning, and uh, you know I, I could never 
I can never do it. <laughs> the vibes. Yeah, the vibes. Yeah. I can never do it. Well, you know, but I don't read music. I don't read. I don't, really don't read music. I've got these three guitars and I play. Yeah, and you've been a working musician all these years. So you're doing something right. Yeah, <laughs> so I, but I'm a drummer. I don't know if you know that, but I'm, no. yeah, I'm a drummer. I've played drums all my life. And uh, that's one thing. Even still, even though the guitars are in here, you well, I'd like to sell all the guitars and get a trap set. <laughs> uh, you know, I sold the trap set for a uh, strange reason, uh, uh, but I had to. And, and so I sold it and I regret it, but I still have the awesome opportunity to play with a lot of great people. Val and, and Bobby Beal and Albert Garcia, all the guys that I have on the show, I'm able to just walk in and play any song, really. It just really didn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught myself every type of genre, and then, you know, from rock to funk, played with Home Cooking. Remember the Home Cooking band by chance? I remember the name, yes. They did, they did Earth, Wind, and Fire really phenomenally well. And I had the audience. Which, which is really good music. That's yeah, really good. So music. I got a chance to do all my percussion there. Mm -hmm. And from that point, I would go to Mickey Gillies. I was one of Mickey Gillies shows. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, did. I thought you knew that. No, I did not. And I'm wow. very impressed to hear that. That's what the show's all about. <laughs> I'm sitting here with a star named Ed O'Connor. Thank, and thank you, you for inviting me here. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Are you kidding me? And yeah, I was there for about a year and a quarter. Wow, and, uh, what a great experience that must have been. Oh yeah, and then the place burned down. I have one photograph with me on the stage with Bo Diddley. And yes, wow. yes, yes. And, uh, I love Bo Diddley. And these guys were playing. I have something, yeah, I'll share that uh, with the most memorable silly moments in just a moment. But okay, we spoke about your guys, the bandmates, and actually uh, my little uh, incarnation of being a fathead over at uh, Gillies. Uh, <laughs> So we've come full circle on the show, and uh, I've heard of your guys, and we've never met, but I'm looking forward to hanging out with them. I really am. And, uh, you've been well, yes, yeah, so I'm like, expecting you Wednesday. You'll be my guest at the show. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, I noticed that it's a swinging birthday bash. Yes. An eight-year affiliation camp. I mean, really. And we we've already talked about this, but it sounds very uh, What what I was reading was something different, and I'll share that with you in a moment. Sure. So, Ken, uh, I had no idea that you have five albums under your belt. Yes. And it's they've incredible. Been, they've been spread out a lot over the years, but yes. Now, who's the composer, and are you doing covers? Oh, uh, mostly covers. They're mostly jazz classics that I did on my own in a couple of That's Spanish classics. That's the thing about doing but jazz. I did, but I did have, um, uh, I did record uh, lyrics, original lyrics set to a traditional Brazilian bossa nova that Barry wrote for me on, on my last studio album. It was, it's called Thoughts of Your Smile, but it's it's to the melody of um, Mania de Carnaval or um, A Day in the Life of a Fool, that song by Luis Bonfa, the Brazilian uh, writer. So uh, I can't I can't pull it out of the memory bank. Well, <clears throat> the, the, you might have you probably heard the melody. It's la, 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 la. Yeah, if you were to listen to any of the almost uh, operatic, <laughs> no, 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 not even more than that. I, mean, I, I haven't been singing today, but um, it's a, it's a. Uh, some of your uh, viewers will will know uh, Brazilian bossa nova music, and this oh, particular this particular song became a. a it's called, most people know it as a day in the life of a fool. Um, and so if you look, if they look that up, and if you look that up, I think you'll recognize it because it's definitely a standard now. But Barry, I was looking for something um, fresh for an album I was working on called I'll Take Romance. And so Barry surprised me with a whole new uh, set of lyrics that he had written. And that's how I opened the album. So if anybody gets I'll Take Romance, that's the opening song. That's, that's your fourth album. That's your that, was, album. that was my fourth one, yeah. And the one that you personally have out is You've Gotta Have Hearts. Yes, and that single on that, right? Yes, that Ken one. Slavin live at the Metropolitan Room in New York. Yes. Get a rope. And it's been several <laughs> years now since that one came out, but the, uh, that was a one-shot deal because I had been offered the chance to make a New York singing debut in 2013. That's what it was. And so... Was that the room that you said, Ed, this is not as big as it looks? Are you, I, I was commenting about 
the arena or the, 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 the place where you were playing. Oh, was it, I saw was it, some of the, was it, was it the video where there was a lot of live footage of me? It scene. was in New York. There was no yes. live, it was just a photograph of, of the facility and you on stage. Oh, that was probably And I said, wow, that's a heck of a play. And you said, you, you came back and said, oh, it's not that no, no, you're thinking of the Triad Theater, which is where I go now. It's, it's a beautiful room. But in the photos, it looks like a big theater, but it only seats 100 people. So it's well, a, that's a lot of people, Ken. <laughs> Uh, but the Metropolitan Room was something that was very serendipitous for me, and the whole reason I called it You Gotta Have Heart and, and added that song to the album was I had just discovered uh, a couple of months before that I had heart disease, and I had just had four stents put in my heart. Wow. And I got this offer to come sing in New York, and I felt so blessed by it, and so blessed that I had actually um, not had a heart attack and died that I decided to make the album a fundraiser for the American Heart Association local chapter. So I, the first, um, there was a small percentage that I gave of sales in that first year to the Heart Association. Mm -hmm. And so that, that album was not just about debuting in New York, but a, a big thanks to God and family and friends who Make sure I was still alive. Oh my so, God. So I went up there and. Make sure I'm still alive. Yes. And since I didn't know, you know, you, you never know. You can go up to New York and do a show and then they never want you back again. So I did a fundraiser to raise the funds to make this album. And uh, part of the funds were the things I needed to record. And so Barry Brake, the pianist I was telling you about, is also an incredible recording engineer and uh, producer. He came up and ran everything on the show and recorded it and then he mixed it down to an album that we had ready by Christmas time. The show was in October and we had it ready by Christmas and it was it, the exact show from beginning to end. It was a 60 minute show in New York and that's how long the album runs uh, because they watch your clock there. You can't go over time on a show. Yeah. So anyway, it, it's the whole live experience and I haven't done any recording since then, and I'm eager to. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I mean, what a great venue, and that's why you're appreciated pretty much worldwide. You, you've sung really all over the place, not just New York and San Antonio, but name some of the places which you Well, a, a few places. I can't say that I'm, the only reason that I'm known around the world by some people is Your through, dad? The, is through <laughs> the internet. No, it's through the internet. Oh, it's yeah. unbelievable. I've, I've tried to parlay online work and digital downloads and that's how I've ended up with fans in places like the Czech Republic and France and Spain and I have a fan who lives in Macedonia. <laughs> but the, 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 I have sung in some nice places, Ireland most recently. Yeah. I've, sung, I've gone back to Alaska to perform, I've performed in Mexico, but mostly in the US and mostly in Texas. But I don't complain uh, that I, you know, if it, if it never went any further I've had so much fun doing it, and I've had, I've made so many wonderful friends as a result of music. No, praise God! I hope I'm one of them. Of course you are. <laughs> I wouldn't be here yet if that. I were know, I know. I'm just teasing. But yeah, you gotta have heart. I love the title uh, and the fourth album. We, we talked about this. I'll take romance. Mm -hmm. Another great title. And um, you know, I you, you have it programmed on music choices, singers and swing. Yeah, that's one of the cable music stations. And I didn't even real I never approached them. I didn't I had not I didn't know about them. And then one day a few years back, it was I I'll take romance had been out for a couple of years and, and I, I it didn't seem to be doing anything. And then um, a friend somewhere far flung from here, I don't remember, somewhere up north took a picture of the TV screen because I popped up on the screen and my music was playing and it had my name and it had the Music Choice logo. So I get this picture saying, look, you're, I'm hearing you on cable. Well, I, I started listening to that station on, the, on my television screen and I saw myself pop up and they had my name misspelled. They had me as Kevin Slayman. So I picked up the phone and called them in New York and they fixed it for me. And then the next thing I knew, they were trying to they, they had programmed six or seven tracks from the album. And it's one of those stations where it's all kind of the same genre. Mm -hmm. So I would have it on and I'd be hearing Bobby Darren, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Vicky Carr, and me. Getting slated, man. It was 
an unbelievable, it was a real rush. <laughs> and then people around the country who knew me started sending me pictures, whatever was on their TV screen. Oh, so wow. I started sharing it on Facebook. And um, I made some nice comments, and Music Choice wrote back and said, we, you know, on Facebook, and said, well, we love playing your music, so. Yeah, yeah. so it's singers and swing. Singers and swing. You know, when I read that, I read it real fast, and I thought it said, swingers that sing. <laughs> I thought that's well, you never know. know. It. You never know. <laughs> that gave one head of a twist, <laughs> twist and turn. So all recordings are available yes. on uh, your web page. You got Apple, you have iTunes, and you take it away from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically Amazon. I where there's digital music, yeah, Amazon. And um, and my what you brought up my website, it is in that need of an overhaul. And during the pandemic, yeah. I thought I was going to do it all that work over the pandemic. And we were talking about how yes. it was hard to get motivated. It really was. And so it been. I, I, it's been migrated to a new host company out of Los Angeles, but it needs an overhaul. So anyone who's going to KenSlaven.com now is going to think it's kind of frozen in time because there's, you know, I used to have the calendar updated every week and all that sort of thing, but that isn't what's Well, you do have a ton of websites. You know, you just go to your profile and really show up. Oh, you mean off of Facebook? <laughs> Some of them aren't being used anymore, like MySpace. That was the, that, I was using that before there was Facebook. <laughs> that was to promote my music. And you can't I didn't even know about it before there was Facebook. <laughs> uh, so we've got two things in common here. I mean, I know for certain. That's music and San Antonio Parks and Recreation. Yes. I, I am very fond of all of their uh, natural, the parks. Yes. Here in San Antonio, we have yes. some of the best parks. Oh, you. The best zoo, not us. Mm -hmm. But I had approached them about doing talk shows from uh, the different parks. Yeah. Uh, and, and wanting to advertise the different parks to bring them more alive than what they are presently. And, and they are very well, uh, they're great attractions. But I just wanted to, you know, entwine the musicians into that outdoorsy kind of groove. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about doing the show over there. And I thought, yes. well, not until we sign on together. And they'd like the idea, but being a solo act, it's really difficult to get everything out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, without any uh, financial backing, it's even more difficult. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to get a lot of these things accomplished. And uh, well, and I think you know, we're talking about it. Well, yes, and I, and I actually think that you will because you seem to be, you seem to persist in doing the things you want to do and, and the ideas you have. You've done it with this program, so yeah. there's no reason why you can't keep pushing. Yeah, I, I don't see why not, so we'll, we'll keep on on that. And we had talked about your mentor. Uh, you know, for me, it was the Royal Gestures on the west side oh, of San Antonio. Yes. Talk about Joe Posada, good yes. intro and back in the end. But uh, we were off Colima Street, my family was living there, and lo and behold, I think I was uh, younger than in the third grade. I don't think that I was in school yet, and the Royal Gestures were rehearsing right across the street. They would let no one in. They were adamant about not letting anyone in, but they would let this little Mexican boy, oh, Eddie, they let me, I was about this tall, and I would sit underneath the snare drum. I could literally see the underneath of the snare drum as I sat oh, wow. by the drums. Wow. And everything was glitter blue, the drum set, the custom amps, and um, the sound was just incredible. As a little boy, I mean, I didn't know what they were playing, but I knew that it was in tune, and it reminded me of Archie Bell and the drums. Oh, wow. Remember, remember yes. Archie Bell and the drums from Houston, well, you know, I actually, I actually got to meet him. Yeah. A couple of years ago, right, right before the right, right in the in the fall of nineteen, before the pandemic, I was invited to be in that um, Christmas parade where they were honoring Texas music. They they invited me to be on a float, but I was performing in New York the same week and I couldn't do it. But they honored me by inviting me to the press conference to announce it, and they it, they included my portrait with the others. So that day when we got our portraits yeah. that were being displayed to kind of promote this whole thing. Yeah. I got to meet Archie and I got to pose with him. I In fact, there's a picture of I know, this? but there's a picture of Archie and me and Al, uh, Albert uh, Garcia. Garcia. Yeah. There's a picture of the three of us together yeah. holding up our pictures. Ask him; you'll find out. 
That's incredible. I had a wonderful time talking to, to both of them. Yeah. Albert I'd known over the years, but, funny, I had, yeah. but I had never met Ar I had never met Archie Bell, and I was like, oh my, you know, like you said, from Houston, Texas. Yeah. yeah. We, it, it was the Archie Bell the drill. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. And I it was the Titan. It was the Titan. Yeah. 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 And I used to dance yeah. that song with my fraternity in college. We used to play that, we used to play that at the toga parties. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and, to, you know, we were talking about, I don't know what we were talking about. I led over here to the Paul McCartney ticket. Uh, oh, wow. That was a story of which uh, I really should hang on to this, but still. I was taking my son to Clark High School at 8.42 in the morning. We were a little late, and KTFM comes out and says, we want to talk to Paul McCartney. Uh, first person who can sell us on uh, the Paul McCartney gig, call in, we want to talk to Paul, and yeah, yeah. I told my son I can do it, and he said, no, you can't, Dad. I did it, I won the tickets, and I contacted Ed uh, Jr. at Clark High School, and I told his uh, principal, they pulled him out of, uh, out of class to tell him I won the tickets, oh, and, and he and I ended up seeing Linda and, and Paul McCartney. Oh, and did you get to meet them? 50 yard line seats, no. I didn't even go that far. I was just so happy. Oh my God. I know, yeah. I wanted to, but I, I couldn't I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I, I just well, but like, think of the experience you had right up there. Good for you. What year was that? Uh, well, it was the first concert that was at the Dome. The well, 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 then you're the first concert. Well, you, well, here's another connection here, because I was thinking, oh, this, my sound, God. this sounds familiar. The Atkins agency where I worked, we did the public relations for the Animal Devil oh in Orlando, and we promoted that show. Wow. I, wow. I did not go to that show. I went to the one later that year with um, Elton John and Billy Joel. Yes, I we, that was a and great we, show. And we promoted the Rolling Stones. And we, but I remember this, and I was like, that sounds familiar. And I'm seeing, <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm the one that put out the press releases. And stuff oh, my like gosh. That. Yeah. That is so trippy. But I and I think the reason I wasn't there was because I had a gig. You know how that goes. <laughs> yes. Get money first. But good for you to have actually seen him in person and to enjoy that. Wow, and winning the tickets like you did. See? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know. That that was just a cool thing. I just thought I'd throw that in for the sake of it. Well, you should. You know? And um, I love it. And so let's see, let's see. Where are we here? Uh, looking back. What and where were some of your best gigs? Now, we've talked about the castle. <laughs> That's got to be way on up there. I don't think you could, you know, I'll do that. No, no, you can't. It was pretty magical. I will say um, the most exciting night of my entire singing career was the night I first sang in New York. I had always York, wanted to sing in New York City, I'm, and I had tried for years, and I had never been able to get a gig there. And then I was so... That was the happiest musical night of my career. Wow. I felt like a, I just, it was, I couldn't believe it. Everything went right. The, 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 uh, I, I hired a New York trio. They were fantastic. The club was wonderful. I had a dressing room, which I had never had. Mm. Someone had sent flowers. A ton of people from San Antonio flew up for the show. Oh, really? Yeah, people like Chris Duell and uh, Susan Reed, who was the, um, um, uh, Bear County District Attorney. At I time. remember Susan Reed. Jane Macon and some others. And then the, uh, Jane Macon, the, one of the San Antonio folks, took me and Barry to 21, the famous club in, in Manhattan, after the show. So I got, it was like a dream. And then my friend Paul, the one who owns the castle, mm -hmm. he has a beautiful home in Manhattan. So he put me up for the whole week. I felt like Jeez. I felt I felt like you know a royalty. musical royalty. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, the the sheer realization of a dream of wanting to always sing in New York, and it happened. And I was 52 years old when it happened, and I absolutely was thrilled by every moment of it. It was very hard to come back from all of that. It was that was the most exciting musical night for me. And, and actually, New York City, you would have to think, is your second home. Well, like, would you say it's the first home no, or second home? I wouldn't put it quite that way, but I will say that um, us outside of San Antonio, yeah. it's my favorite city in the country, that's for that, sure. That's probably what I And asked. I think it's because I also have roots going back there so long ago when I was a kid, so I've always had a, a, a warm spot for New York. Mm -hmm. But I, I love the energy of New York, and I love how eclectic New York is, and I love how fast-paced everything is, and the architecture, the food, you know, everything about it. Now you asked about other gigs. Yes. The 
most important, there are two important gigs for me, I think that kind of were early on that helped cement all of this for me. The, the night that George Prado asked me, or gave me the chance to fill in for his singer for one set. That was in 1990. That was a blessing. And then in 1994, I did my first concert. And I did it as a fundraiser for the San Antonio AIDS Foundation. And I did it at the Carver, the Carver Cultural Center. Oh, I love that place. That was the, my first real concert. That was an extremely exciting night that also made me so nervous that for the first few songs, I was trying to hold my hand steady like this with the microphone and yeah. not mess up my voice. And in the middle, add a little vibrato. Yes. And in the middle of the first set, um, I started singing a kind of an emotional song, and I burst into tears in front of everybody. I couldn't control myself. Oh my gosh! It was that emotional. Wow. Yeah. So. Those were those were kind of milestone things you oh remember gosh, in yeah. terms of a lot I mean, of That'll never happen again, I don't right, think. Right. That'll never happen to, to capture all those emotions mm -hmm. to where you would come to tears. I don't think that uh, I've ever cried on stage. I think I've made other people cry though. <laughs> <laughs> I have this gut feeling uh, which which leads us into our next segue, which is most memorable silly moments. I know. And uh, if, if you can't pull it two or one or two out, uh, I'll help you. Uh, but yeah, have you been thinking about a most memorable? Yeah, I was. I was. I want two of them, by the way. Well, <laughs> tell, tell, tell me your, one tell, one. tell me yours first. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. I'm not going to say the musicians of which I, this happened, but you know, I'm hired gun as well. I'm playing trap set. I met them at the, at the Blues Society, and so they hired me for a Christmas gig, and. Uh, I knew all the guys because I was jamming with all of them. And um, I ended up showing up a week early for the gig. But they were there. Oh, the band oh. which I was supposed to play, Catherine Dawn uh, and her associates. I was supposed to play with them. Uh, actually, not her, but the other band that was associated with her. Uh, they had a fallout. And nonetheless, her other band hired me. I ended up showing up. Both of the bands were there, Catherine Dawn and the other. And I thought it was time to set up. You know, I'm there, I'm early. I've got all my traps set, all my lights, everything. I'm just really happy to be there. It's Christmas. <laughs> I'm a week early, Ken. That is fun. I've never heard that. Very it's punctual. Music, musicians are usually late, <laughs> not, not a week early. I was way early, man. Wow. Well, here's, here's the clincher. Um, I'm trying to remember who it was. Michael, someone or another. Anyway, uh, and Doc were playing that night, and uh, they hired me to play. So oh. I didn't skip a beat. So yeah, so it wasn't a lost opportunity. You were no, able to play. Was really I got to play two Christmas gigs, and this was out in the country, uh, somewhere out Blanco Road or Bandera, one of the two. It was very dark. <laughs> it was very dark, and the only thing yeah. you could see were the Christmas lights from afar. So and myself, you know, being there so early. But uh, I love it. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, I don't. Even, I don't even think it's silly. It shows great heart. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm so versatile. I can play with just about anybody, really. Mm -hmm. uh, especially on trap set, because you're not you're not hitting notes. You're just hitting drums. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're the tempo. You're the backbeat. Mm -hmm. uh, without you, the guys just kind of fall apart. You mm -hmm. know, and actually, you can be the reason why they fall apart if you don't watch it. So. College gigs. Now, this is another pretty rowdy experience for myself. We were playing at a bar on Fredericksburg Road. Mm -hmm. Do you remember um, the flea market on Fredericksburg? Yes. Road? Okay. Yeah. Well, they had a bar at the back of it that would uh, take care of all the patrons, and this is where uh, Butch, uh, Morgan, Claude used to play out there. Um, another guy, both both Claude and, and uh, Joe. I've been on the show, and anyway, we're playing this bar, and we're playing rock and roll. We're doing, we're doing, in fact, the Doobie Brothers. We're playing a whole medley of the Doobie Brothers, and a fight breaks out, and we're playing and going right at it. We've got people in the front row, and you can see from the pool room, pool sticks flying, bodies flying, chairs flying, and people screaming. Uh, the last thing I remember was uh, the bartender pulled a shotgun 
and blew a hole in the roof in, in that facility. And it just went blam, you know, super loud. Everybody just ran and scattered. All I could think of was good to be king. <laughs> that guy with, the guy with the gun just shut everybody up. Oh my God. But I thought that was absolutely incredible uh, to see all these bodies. Uh, and that wasn't the first time, that wasn't the last time either. So I mean, that, that's the, I think the hazard of, of doing these rock gigs. I really am more appreciative of like country and jazz, funk. They're a little more better behaved. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> But yeah, can you pull anything out? Well, right. yeah, I was the most I'm, memorable sitting on the team. You know, you're pretty structured. Well, the thing is, I, I, have a, I have a whole lot of fun with my audiences, and I try to be uh, loose with them and tell stories about the songs I'm, I'm doing and all of that. And, I, and we were talking earlier about really feeding off of the energy of an audience. Because sure. it's very, even if you've had, a, in my case anyway, even if I've had a really bad day or I'm feeling really down, as soon as I start to sing, I feel better. And then I love the, there's nothing like the live performance. It's not the same as recording. Recording to me is not nowhere near as fun <clears throat> as being right there in front of people and getting an instant uh, rapport going. Well, in that vein, several years ago, I was doing a, uh, a private Christmas party um, for uh, a big jeweler. It was for um, the Green, I'm uh, forgetting his first name, Green, his last name was Green, but it was a high-end kind of custom jewelry company. <clears throat> and they had done, they put those big catering tents out in their parking lot, and it was formal, it was a black tie event, so everybody's all dressed, and my band and I are up on a, a very nice stage, all dressed in, uh, in tuxedos. And we were playing, and it, we were, it really wasn't like doing a concert gig or even a dance gig so much as we were atmosphere for the party. But people, I mean, this was the kind of party where there's, you know, a tower of shrimp and there's caviar and there's all the things going on. So wow. it's, it's really beautiful. But it also was decorated like a traditional Christmas yeah. place with, you know, real wreaths, not artificial greenery, but these beautiful wreaths. And they were, um, you know, lit with candles and stuff. It was very, very, very pretty. Mm -hmm. Well, I was singing, and it was close to the end of one of the sets, and we had a little group of people who were paying attention and really liking us, so we were really, I was probably panning it up a little bit. We were doing Fever, the song Fever. Okay. And so we're going along, and people are clapping and everything, and then um, uh, toward the end, when it's, it's saying, what a lovely way to burn, what a lovely way to burn, well, and you're going, you know, all this stuff. They, I'm trying to... Yeah, I think that stage of the song is hot, it's fever, it's burning, and um, all of a sudden people just start cheering, and I and, and I think they're cheering. I thought they were cheering, <laughs> and, I, and I and I always have this silly thing I do with fever at the end. I go like, you know. Well, I was doing all that, and they were just having this huge, uproarious thing, and they're pointing, and I thought, oh my God, they're loving it. Well, what happened was when I got to that part of the song. One of the Christmas wreaths above the stage with candles in it fell, <laughs> and it fell on my bass player's amp. You know, with the it has that the kind of fuzzy felt material on top, and it went it caught on fire. Oh my So God. they weren't sh shouting at me and thinking the song was hot. <laughs> the stage was literally on fire, and so the the woman in charge of the event came over and started smashing, <laughs> smashing the fire out, and then and there was damage to it, and of course. Like a true bass player or a true musician, you, you've heard his axe. It's not the bass itself, but it's, you know, the whole thing. You've touched it, you've heard it. So it didn't matter if the fire was out and disaster was averted. It was like, well, what about my amp? You know, that kind of thing. So it was, uh, it, I don't know that it qualifies as a silly moment, except that I got so caught up, I thought that I had really turned the audience on, but all it was was a, a giant fire right behind me. So <laughs> That's funny. That came to mind. Yeah. I know it's hard for me to there, burn, there's, burn. But you know, there's a lot of silliness sometimes in the work we do, and funny things happen. And but you're also performing live, and so you just go on to the next thing, right? Like when you forget a lyric, or you forget where you are. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking about that today. How you know, we might forget where we are in the lyric, yeah, and all that stuff, but we never forget to not stop. Yeah, you just have to you just have to plug on. I learned that very early on because I, I freaked out early on in one of my early gigs. Yeah. And I just stopped and made the whole band stop and everything. And I was sure. told don't ever do that again. Yeah. So 
Yeah, and I did one at Sam's. I think I played with the Guitar Wars band, and the bass player gave me a head fake. You know, I'm, I'm part of the rhythm section, and when the bass player kind of looks at me and goes like, you know, then it's time to end the song. And so I ended the song, and they were still playing. <laughs> oh no, not Sam's. And uh, they know I'm a good player. They know I'm a good player, but you know when that happened, I kind of comedically said, "He gave me a head fake." <laughs> Don't you agree that um, Sam's is a great place to play? Are you kidding me? Absolutely. I love that stage, and I love the room, and I love John. I love John. John makes everything John, sound John, so great. I tell John all the John, time. John, shout out to your brother. Yeah, he's he's fantastic. It's just such a easy, fun place to play. They treat you really well. Oh yeah. And it just it sounds great. The the lighting and the sound are great. People who don't know Sam's will say, Sam's burger joint, what you yeah. playing in a hamburger? It's like, well first of all, my whole career has been hamburgers. I played <laughs> at Dick's. The first time I ever put a band together was at Chris Madrid's. I did my first yeah, album yeah, release at Chris Madrid's. Madrid's. Yeah, I knew Chris from the time I was in college. So, wow. I, and I used to play every year this birthday show I do at Sam's now, I used uh -huh. to do it at Typhoon Flats in the uh, early and mid 90s. So, or yeah, around the mid 90s. For about four or five years in a row, I did Typhoon Flats, which was known for its burgers. Mm -hmm. And then I, it, when I started playing back at Sam's, I told everybody I'd come full circle mm -hmm. on the San Antonio burger circuit. Well, from burgers to martinis. That's right. But actually, I combine them. There's nothing wrong with having a burger <laughs> and a martini at the same time. I do that. So that's the only a Texas guy can I do know. that. I know, but see, it, and it works at Sam's. You can have there's a full bar, sure. and then you can have burgers and, and fries. But the point is, it's a, it's it's Sam's for any band. It's what you make of it. Sure. And San Antonio, San Antonio loves things that are eclectic. Yeah. I, I don't think that some of what I do would even work anywhere else. It works in San Antonio because I think San Antonio, I think San Antonio audiences are the nicest and most accepting in the world. They really Probably are. The most appreciative because, you know, we come from that background. Mm -hmm. We have the great Tejano Conjunto, mm -hmm. the Mexican culture, mm -hmm. uh, not only the food, but the music of which we play. And I mean, the jazz influence. I remember that there was a uh, jazz club back in uh, or on uh, San Pedro, where the old solo serve used to be. Oh, really? The, uh, it was I called know. Tiffany or something or another. That was before uh, my time. And actually, there was a, a drummer that came in from out of state. He was with the Roy Rogers band. You know, oh, Roy Rogers. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. They came to play the Hemisphere Arena, and the guy rented a duplex right next to me, uh, where we were living. And I would hear his his music, and I just gravitated over there. We, we struck up a friendship, and he got me tickets for the entire family, front row seats to see Roy Rogers wow. while he's on the trap set. That is fantastic. And he was one hell of a drum. I mean, he's wow. totally rudimentally inclined, which I am not. I'm more of a Ringo Starr drummer. Keep time, do the drum, you know, do the drum thing when it's needed. Don't overkill. Mm -hmm. Not too, too all over the place. Um, just very useful. Uh, time for trap set. Well, there you go. And uh, no, I've enjoyed that kind of group, but uh, I also uh, appreciate the guys that do rudiments, you know, triplets and all this other yeah. kind of stuff. I've always wanted to do that. Well, you're gonna love hearing uh, Darren. I don't think you've heard Darren Cooper, the drummer who'll be with me on no. tonight. No, no, but I have heard his name. Yeah, you're gonna I love know. his brushwork. His oh, brushwork gosh. is unbelievable. I love that kind of group. Yeah. So. Now it's time for shout outs. We're, we're just about done over here, but sure. shout outs. Who would you like to say hi to out of all the folks? In, and you can just go on and on if you want to. But uh, yeah, if, if you have anybody that you would like to do a shout out to, now is your time. Well, I would, I'd love to say hello to my brother and sister who oh, are right. here in San Antonio. Like hey. family. My brother is Al Slayman, um, and my sister is Alice Geyser, and, and her their spouses, George, and, and my brother's. Um, uh, wife Newell and their children. Um, okay. I, of course, I'd love to say shout out to any of the San Antonio musicians who are watching the program who, who know me, and um, I send my love and appreciation to all of you because we're all in this together. And it's Forrest Ballard like, sends his love. Oh, I love Forrest. Yeah. In fact, Forrest, Forrest wrote me and said he was going to try to come to the show. Well, that's if I get an extra ticket. <laughs> I'll come with you. He can come with you. Sure. You know, it sure. was either a gal or, or Forrest. I'm thinking, eh, Forrest. No, that's fine. That's <laughs> I remember going to uh, 
fundraiser for him years ago. Yes, and we mentioned class. that. We were talking just oh. last night. In fact, I sang at it, I think. I, I believe I so. Think I did, yeah. So he, yeah, he, I wrote you that. He holds you in such high regard. He really oh, well, I think he's a, a very fine guy. So yeah, bring him with you for sure. Uh -huh. um, of course, I'd love to say, to, um, among musician friends, I definitely want to do a shout out to George Prado because he just celebrated his 80th birthday. Way to go, George. And I wasn't able to be at the, the uh, gathering that earlier this week, it was on Monday evening, and, and I ended up having to work really late, so I couldn't be there. But George, you know, he was, he was my first guy in music. I love him dearly. And so shout out to him and to his wife, Beverly, and to his son, Aaron, who's an incredible musician as well, and also teaches at Alamo Colleges. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he teaches at one of the other Alamo Colleges. Um, I'd like to do shout outs to, oh, golly, I don't know who, who else. I guess anyone in town who comes to hear me or is interested in hearing me, uh, who have supported me in the past. And you've got to check this cut out, man. You just got to do it for your own sake, man. I think your your uh, your heart will be healed. Oh. Not to say that it's broken. No, we have a lot of yeah. Well, I, I, I just hope everyone who's watching will take the time to come out, take the time to check out the music online, and support Ed's program. I think the fact that he's doing this kind of podcast is a great idea. And I, as I said earlier, it gives a nice uh, and uh, important voice to people in our in our business. I mean, we're all in it together. We are, we're totally all in it together, no matter what style you do. And that is one of the beautiful things about this city. I think we come together for both good times and bad. I, I, I don't think it matters what you play or what you do. I think we have respect and caring for each other. I mean, it's very well said, yes. My shout out would be naturally to my son and his lovely wife, Edward and uh, Elizabeth, uh, and their, uh, well, my grandchildren, uh, Eddie, Gigi, and uh, there's uh, John, and they're all in photograph form over there. I saw those pictures. Yeah, yeah. They're, my, they're my extended family. Yeah. But also the Cove, uh, Lukenbach, Texas, Sam's Burger Joint, uh, Fitzgerald's Bar, all of the Houston area, Dallas area, New Braunfels, where I lived in for two years, uh, the Mine Shaft, which is the time machine, and we've yes. got a show from there a couple of times. Uh -huh. uh, the Thirsty Camel, just the name of the Oh, field. I love there. I played there a few times. Place. It's been a few years, but I, I did two or three shows there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, the Thirsty Camel. In Alma Hunt, right? Yes. That's, yes. A, that's a great place. You know, it's uh, Michael Michael and the Max. It was one of their guys that owns the bar. Did you know that? Yes. I mean, I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was pretty phenomenal. These guys have just gone on to do so well. Michael Morales, you know. He's terrific. I, I haven't seen him in years, but I, I know him, and he's a great guy. Yeah, and you know, you never see him around, but you hear his work. He does all the commercials. Oh, yeah, he's, and he's, a, he's a recording engineer, producer. Singer, of course, was a, was a big star in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who do you give your love to was a song. And I was DJing, and it was, Who do you give your love to? I and, remember that, yeah. yeah. Honey, you stop the fire. I <laughs> mean, like, oh. but that was a uh, it was a sound effect that he had actually come up with. Mm -hmm. I think he and Bubba Perron and, and Laurent Perron. Kind of shout out to the Perron brothers. Mm -hmm. um, they were some rockers from way back, but they were they started off doing the thing where um, they would change the name of the band, so there would be like three different bands, same guys. I thought that was really pretty heavy to get more gigs. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Competing with yourself, but and probably different genres, right? But it was well, just a slight twist. But yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you've got to hustle the gig. George, sure. George Prado taught me that from day one. You've got to hustle the the the, the, mute, the gig, and you've got to uh, take care of business with your with your bandmates. Yeah. Well, yeah. since you're naming all these places, I want to also do a shout there out to, to Bernie Firstpan, who is the man who books me in New York yeah. and, uh, at the Triad. First at the Metropolitan Room, now at the Triad Theater. I'd like to um, say I'd like to shout out to the musicians who are going to play with us on Wednesday night: um, Darren Cooper, Chuck Moses, Barry Brake, and Joe Caplo, and uh, to the jazz protagonists uh, Barry and and, and uh, Darren have their own jazz trio with Greg Norris, but uh, they're called the Jazz Protagonists, and they have their own radio program and everything. And um, 
Oh my goodness, while we're at it, let me do a shout out to Connie Francis, my friend, the re famous recording artist who oh lives in Florida. She's been a client of mine now for a few years, yes. And because, uh, you know, she may see this, you never know. She, she follows she, lots of stuff online. And she's a wonderful lady, actress, mm -hmm. and singer. singer yeah. I mean, uh, who hasn't heard of Connie Francis? Yeah. And she's a native San Antonio. No, is that she correct? No, she's Or does she call native, San Antonio her, her home? Mm -mm, native, why why native, is it that I just. New Jersey. Why, why is it that I always think in terms of. Are you thinking I know of, she's such a hit. You're thinking of Vicki Carr. That's correct. Thank you. Well, let's do a shout out to her, too. Yes, Vicki Carr. I've actually, I've I've actually sure. spoken with her many times. At one time, I performed Carol with Burnett. her. Carol Burnett? I mean, did, did you, you ever get to meet her? I got to meet no. her. No. I introduced my mother to Carol Burnett. Oh, I'd love to, though. Oh, uh, we know a lot of people between us. Uh, <laughs> shout outs to all of them. Um, yes. Sending love and, and music and good thoughts and anyone in, uh, here in our area who can come to the Sam show, we'd love to have you there to, to entertain you and, and spend time with you um, on Wednesday night. That sounds so solid. And with that said, Cam, I think it's about time to cut out. And, and we, we go out typically with these kind of words to say, go out and go do something good for somebody today because we're out to change the world one day at a time. Isn't that right, Cam? That's right. You know, one day at a time. We just make one person maybe laugh, smile, and get their mind off the turmoil and, and uh, the stuff that's going on in Ukraine. Not to say that we should forget it, we just should uh, try to maneuver our way around it sometimes. Well, we have to We have to find a way to to push forward. Always. Yes, continue. And like you said, the only really way you can do it is, is one day at a time. And I think you're doing a very fine job in that regard with your podcast, and I wish you good luck with it. Thank you so very much, Ken. Well, again, once again, ladies and gentlemen, I, I can already hear the crowd roaring. <laughs> anyway, Ken Slavin, wonderful artist. Come out and see him. Uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, August the 24th, it's his 29th birthday again. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be there. Uh, you know, Forrest Ballard will be out there. Yes. And uh, we're just going to have a blast. I'll take some video, probably of one or two of his songs. I'm going to blow his entire gig. And uh, but we'll turn you on to a tidbit. Great, I got you to that. You make sure I have all this footage too for me. Absolutely, yes, yes. I, that's why I save it like this. I you know, so many times it gets lost mm -hmm. in the airwaves. Yeah, it does. Oh, there's time we have a master. <laughs> well, thanks again, Ed. Very well, God much. bless you, my friend. Me God too. bless you. Such me a too. pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Okay, guys, have a blessed night. Good night to you. We love you. <laughs>